Good morning, everyone, as we come together on a, another Sabbath morning, as we uh, come together to uh, worship our, our Lord and Savior. Uh, but it's also uh, a weekend that we want to remember uh, what happened in uh, 2001, the 9-11, uh, and uh, uh, the lives that were lost, and uh, just the changes that have come about over our country because of that. So uh, before our prayer for illumination, as we bow, I'd like to uh, everyone just to take a moment and uh, in silent prayer, uh, lift up your prayers to the Lord for uh, all the victims of 9-11. Uh, so let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Lord, also on this day, we open up our hearts and pray that we'll open up our minds and uh, to receive what it is you have for us today. As we come into your place to worship, may we leave all the things of the world on the outside and clear our minds of all the things that we have in our minds dedicated to you for you to talk to us and for you to touch us in a special way. Open our hearts, Lord. Open our minds to receive what you have for us. Amen. The scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 14. Exodus 14, I'll be reading verses 19 through 31. So let us hear the word of the Lord. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And a pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with the darkness and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord had did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Thanks be to God. As we're moving right along, not only in our Christian year, but in our physical years, I think we're now entering the last week of summer this year. Uh, we're now in the uh, 15th Sunday 
after Pentecost in our Christian year. Last week, as you remember, the first Passover was instituted in the scripture as God gives Moses and Aaron all the instructions on this perpetual ordinance and how it was to be accomplished. Since it led to up to the scripture reading for this week, uh, Moses and Aaron have uh, presented that uh, to the people. Uh, the Passover has come and gone. Uh, and after the 10th plague, which was the Passover, and which was uh, the death of all the firstborn uh, of the Egyptians. Uh, on the night of that Passover, in the middle of the night, Pharaoh called or summoned Moses and Aaron to come to him. And in scripture in uh, chapter 12, verses 31b and 32, I uh, shall read. Rise up, go away from my people, both of you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord, as you said. Take your flocks and your herds, as you said, and be gone. And I thought this was interesting. This was the last sentence that Pharaoh told them. And bring a blessing on me too. And bring a blessing on me too. That night, after 430 years in Egypt, the exodus from Egypt began. The route that the people took or the Lord led them on was not the, was not the shortest route. The shortest route would have taken through the land of the Philistines, but God was afraid that once they got there and the conflict came that they would turn and return back to Egypt. So the wilderness route by way of the Red Sea is the one that the Lord selected. As time went on, as we know, Pharaoh's army started pursuing the people as they were just approaching the Red Sea. And the people of Israel panicked as they saw this great army uh, pursuing them. And that's where we pick up with our scripture reading from this morning. Verses 19 and 20 again. The angel of God who was going before the Israelite army moved and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel. And so the cloud was there with darkness and it lit up the night. One, uh, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. The angel of God, or sometimes referred to as uh, the angel of the Lord, and the pillar of cloud cooperated to protect and lead the Israelites as they repositioned themselves from the front to the back. And the pillar is strongly associated and, uh, with uh, the Lord himself. Uh, some of the commentators uh, uh, point this out. But in verse 16, or in verse 21 of uh, uh, chapter 13, it says that the Lord went in front of them in a pillar of cloud during the day and in a pillar of night, uh, a pillar of fire by night. So it pretty much says, Scripture tells us, yes, the Lord was in the pillar uh, as it moved, and the angel of God was there with him as well. The pillar became two different realities. The first one was a curse to the pursuing Egyptians, and the second, obviously, was a blessing to the entrapped Israelites. Though there is darkness with the cloud, Scripture tells us that it lit up the night. And some commentators say is that maybe it started out in the day and moved through the night. But I like how the scripture and how they interpret and how it was read in the New King James Version, and I'll share that with you now. It says, thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one and gave light to the other, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. And that interpretation there is always leaves that, you know, it was light toward the Egyptian and it was darkness toward uh, toward the, uh, I mean, it was light toward the Israelites and darkness toward uh, the Egyptians, which I think kind of gives us a visual to, to see how that was. But as we go through this, and a lot of scripture is a lot of the, the, the minute, minute details that a lot of people try to just get in and dig on, but, you know, the time that it actually took for all of them to cross uh, the the Red Sea, just, just how many of Israelites was it? Scripture tells us that there were 600,000 men. So when you add the children and the women, there were quite a few. And just how long that took, who knows? 
but it doesn't really matter. The small details sometimes cloud over what the message is for us. So we don't want to do that. And we want to look at it and just remember that the Lord was in the pillar of that cloud. The Lord was in control of all this action. And that's the proper focus for us as we read the scripture. And it was the focus for the people of Israel as they were experiencing this. But God commanded Moses to lift up uh, his staff and stretch out his hand in verse 16. That was his pre-instructions of uh, uh, what was to happen. Now Moses, in this uh, scripture we read this morning, stretches out his hands over the sea and uh, likely still had his staff in his hand. And the point we want to hear is that, that he did this and the water separated, but this was not some magical act that Moses performed. Moses was, was no magician. The power was from God himself. And it was not the staff of Moses' his hand. It was the power of God. Moses was just the vessel doing God's work. And that's what we have to remember in our missions as well. We are just a vessel of God to do his work, just to shine the light on him, not us. We're just his vessels. God in this instant uses a, a force of nature, and is the wind, to divide the sea. And it was a strong wind, a strong wind from the east. And we may picture an exceedingly strong wind in a narrow boat of driving a wedge through the water, making the two walls of water that will form like a, like a vortex going through. And so I was thinking about this this week. Uh, some things come back to mind. And I know that there's many of you here remember the um, movie The Ten Commandments by Charlton Heston, which came out in the late, late 1950s, uh, where some of us saw it then or later on, but not at all. But I do remember that movie, and the scene in that movie that I remember vividly was, was this one. It's how the, the sea went back, and the looks on those people's faces, uh, those actors, as they were going through, because they had it trained, it looked like waterfalls in the reverse as it was going up, and it was just uh, so much water at all, you could just feel, you know, the, you know, the unish, you know, how, how, tentative they were going through that and seeing all that, but I do remember that scene from that movie to this day. So this, this situation that they found themselves in had to be difficult for them. But the effects of the wind on the waters was so strong that the ground that had been beneath the water had become dry, had become dry. But one of the commentators I read says it was an act of faith on Israel's part to cross over on this dry land everything that was going on. It was faith in God to go through that. They might have refused to go and would have been delivered back to the Egyptian army. And as I was thinking about this and that statement there, I said maybe this is another reason that the angel of God and the pillar went to the back to bring them along. I'm with you. This is okay. You need to go. Encouraging them to proceed on. The startled and confused Egyptians, on the other hand, pursued the Israelites even into the Red Sea. All of this action, all this going on around these people, the time was just right. Then he caused confusion to fall among the Egyptians in the morning watch while it was still dark. That means I know the morning watch was that last watch at night, whether it was the third or the fourth watch, depending on which, which one you look at. But it was the last one, just the dark right before dawn. The crossing of the Israelites, this would have included men, women, children, and livestock. Just how many is not known. How long, we don't know. The thing is, they all made it across. But here again, we've got to remember this is God's plan for God's people. God's plan for God's people. To get them from captivity to the land that he had promised the patriarch Abraham, their father, the land he had promised him many years before, he was moving them to that land. The Lord was with them on the entire journey. After the Israelites had 
crossed over the sea, Moses followed the Lord's instructions and stretched out his hand. The waters began to recede to turn back to normal. Blown apart by the wind, this probably took some time as the wind probably just gradually receded as the water started coming back in. There again, there's discussion on how long all this took, but it doesn't matter. Regardless of that length of time, the Egyptian army perished during this. All of the Egyptian men, horses, equipment that entered the dry bed of the sea, not one of them remained. They all perished. The defeat was total. No doubt some Egyptian warriors had not actually entered the water and had survived. It was them that would spread the word about the Lord being the warrior of Israel. Verses 29 and 30 are basically a recap of all that's happened to lead us in to verse 31. It's about the Israelites walking on dry ground, the waters forming a wall around them, but the Lord saved them on that day from the Egyptians. Verse 31, Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared or had reverence for the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. The great work literally, literally means the great hand. That is, God did it. Moses was just the visible executor. The great climatic verse speaks of the genuine faith of the people of Israel at the end of their experience of God's saving work, saving works, and the beginning of their journey of faith. Their journey of faith. When we read, so the people feared the Lord and the words that follow, we're meant to understand that this community had come to saving faith and so were reborn. Because of their faith, they had brought it through. The Lord had brought them through and they had been re reborn into, these new, into the new people. They believed the Lord the same wording used for Abraham's saving faith in Genesis. It is also significant that the people believed his servant Moses. At the beginning of this miraculous ordeal, as you remember, they had not believed him at all. Not at all. And the people, during this whole process, were transformed spiritually, even as they were delivered physically delivered physically, but they were spiritually changing as well. So this is a this is an interesting story as we go through and just a few verses that are there covered quite a bit of time, quite a bit of experience there. And you can just imagine the confusion of the people of Israel of what was going on. But the pillar and the angel moved from in front to behind. I think this is significant. It's from leading to pushing. And this is something that we need at some times. We're going in that right direction. Sometimes we're maybe a little slow and we just need a little, little push along, a little encouragement to, to move us toward that end goal. The divided waters is important. Of the dry ground. But would we have been like the people of Israel? Would we fear crossing that sea, seeing that wall on each side of us? And, and we could just think of all things that would be different for us today than the walls of water. But there are many things in our society that are just as significant as that, that we have to walk through to make it through what God, what he has in mind for us. Or do we sometimes get to like the clogged chariot wheels? what can stop us or drag us down, make us reluctant to proceed forward in doing the Lord's work. But what great works have we seen from the Lord during our time? Did these great works lead us to have reverence and respect for the Lord? Or do we need that, or do we still need the Lord to, to lead us and to push us along? And I think we're all 
probably in that situation uh, most of the time. The Lord to be with us and to keep us moving forward. Then when we start looking at, at accomplishments, you know what? We do not want to focus too much on what we have done, but we want to look at it in the, in the eyes of what can we improve on it? What, how can we expand? How we can develop maybe into others? Because what happens when you revel in your accomplishments? What are you doing? It's more like a patting me on the back kind of thing, which we don't want to do. Because it's all about kingdom work. That's what we're here for, to do the Lord's work. But we know because of the pandemic, many missions are passed that uh, have been placed on, on hold or delayed or changed or canceled. But as some of the barriers are starting to be removed, we need to start looking and say, okay, now what? Now what? What do we do now? So what is on our to-do list, both personally and collectively? as a congregation in kingdom building, as individuals and as a congregation of kingdom building. Where is God pushing us? Where is he pushing us and what is he wanting us to do? Where or how can we serve or better serve the community in which we live? Are there people hungry in our area? people in need of things that we can maybe reach out and help with? Is he pushing us in that direction? What ministry or ministries is God pushing us toward? Is there a special group of people that we may be able to touch and minister to in some way in our area? We've got to have that mind. We've got to have an open mind. We've got to look forward. We've got to look out there to see where it is. He's probably lighting it up all around us. Once we start looking at some of those, then I think that pillar will come behind us and start supporting us, moving us forward to go where it is that he wants us to be. Or what is it he may be pushing us to do better? What we're doing and what we have done and what we've got going, but how can we improve or how can we make that better? Because God being behind us is not a bad thing at all. Because that's our support back there. It's our support structure. That's our encourager. He's our exhorter as we move forward. So we move forward doing kingdom work. Because he wouldn't be behind us pushing us in that direction if it was not where he wanted us to go. But now, since we're still pretty much in the pandemic phase, with a lot of restrictions, but now's the time that we need to brainstorm and plan. Brainstorm and plan where it is we need to go from here. And when the time is right, we'll have some type of corporate course of action in place for us to move forward. Because the thing that we have to remember, all the restrictions that have been placed on us, God does not want us to become stagnant in serving him. That's the important thing. God does not want us to be stagnant in supporting him and serving him. So we can't do business as usual as we have done in the past, but we develop new ways. Sometimes these new ways develop into better ways. But we have to remember that we have to continue to move and to serve. And remember, just as the Exodus was for the entire congregation of Israel, so is God's plan for us. We are his people in this time and in this place. We are all to be part of whatever ministry it is, whatever action we come with, in whatever way we can. We've got ones that can go out and work, others who are unable to, but those are the encouragers, those are supporters, and those are the ones that are very important to get that accomplished. It's a team effort, and we need to move forward. And remember that he is with us, whether, whether he needs to be before showing where to go once we started the movement to move us forward to get it accomplished. He is going to be with us every step of the way. It is just for us 
to continue to be faithful and to continue to be obedient. So whatever he is leading or pushing us to accomplish, it is all God's plan for us. And we have to always remember that as we move forward, being the obedient servants that he has called us to be. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.